right, folks, morning. Looks like we're about ready to start. If more people will uh, trickle in, that's fine. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for coming. Um, I hope you all enjoy uh, Core C++. I know I did. Um, I'm, I'm um, very happy that uh, you invited me here. I'm um, um, I don't know, thrilled about uh, first day. It was very exciting. Uh, lovely crowd. I had so many interesting discussions with folks um, between sessions and um, after the first day of the conference ended. It was uh, lovely meeting new folks and learn about what you do, what you build, what your problems are, um, and what you're trying to, to learn. And um, also, always happy to see familiar faces and catching up, especially after um, a few years of uh, pandemic breaks. Uh, so it's, uh, it's so lovely to be in person again, such a big crowd, um, and so, um, lovely discussions. Uh, feel free to engage, uh, ask questions, um, happy to uh, have a conversation. Um, don't mind uh, if I'm being interrupted or anything. So uh, let's get started. Uh, by the way, I usually like to walk around the stage, but I need to stay here. <laughs> uh, I'm uh, pinned to the mic, so uh, sorry about that. Uh, so functional programming, in C++, uh, I, I gather if you looked at the um, uh, talk abstract, uh, you kind of figured out where, where I'm going with this. Uh, what, what's it all about? Uh, and it has functional in the name, right? So probably um, we need to encode everything uh, with functions uh, and uh, deal away with our, usually, our usual amenities uh, from other uh, programming paradigms? Uh, well, partially. Uh, functional programming is uh, about concepts like this. Um, I I'm sure many of them are familiar. Some of them we'll discuss uh, today. And, but I want to focus more on, on, on a different way of thinking about structuring computation. And I would start with um, this idea uh, from uh, Bartosz Milewski about the paradox of programming. And it, it's all tied into the machine-human um, impedance mismatch in terms of how we think about computation. So about uh, the difference between local and global reasoning, uh, about being progress or goal-oriented, and how we can deal with uh, errors and propagating errors and chaining computation. And I would say we've all been trained thoroughly in uh, university and, and industry to think like machines. Uh, and um, for good reasons, uh, performance does matter and fitting the mental model to what machines can do uh, really uh, helps um, in, in performance sensitive situations. We're not programming uh, abstract machines here, uh, we're programming real hardware. And I'm gonna uh, try to highlight some of these uh, challenges. But for sure, human comprehension was not built around uh, mutation, uh, memory, caches, these are not structures that are in our brain. Our brains uh, are meant to do logic, and there's a universal language that we've been using for that for over 4,000 years, and that's mathematics. Um, so functional programming is um, a style of programming where basic method of computation is application of function functions. Uh, that's right in the name, right? And a functional programming language is one that supports such a style. Of course, C++ is a multi-paradigm language, uh, and uh, functional is just one way of dealing with it. Uh, but before we get started, let's address the elephant in the room, uh, and it was right there in the abstract, probably. Uh, no, this is not a talk about Haskell, although I have a, a few examples and parallels. Uh, I have uh, parallels with Rust as well, uh, but it's a C++ talk. So what do I mean by functional style? So if we look at this 
piece of uh, trivial code. Uh, and yeah, I know it looks like an accumulate, but let's not go there yet. Uh, what we're doing here is step-by-step step instructing the machine uh, how we want this uh, computation to be performed. And our basic method of uh, achieving this is variable assignment and memory mutation. Whereas if we think in terms of goals, goal-oriented, what we're trying to achieve is convey the, the input, the data we want to work on, and the application, what we're trying to achieve, the process on that data. So the difference would be um, functional is focused about what we're trying to achieve, the, the goal, whereas imperative style is about the mechanics, the details, how we get there. And yes, those details really matter. So I, I, I think uh, this quote from Michael Feathers um, captures the essence fairly well. Um, Object-oriented makes code understandable by encapsulating moving parts, and we've all been accustomed to doing that. Whereas uh, functional programming makes code understandable by minimizing the moving parts, and that's the essence. Uh, the less code, the less things you need to keep in your head, the better the comprehension and less likely to uh, have, um, um, I don't know, oversights, errors, uh, trivial mistakes. And of course, the type system uh, plays a big role in, in helping with that. But before we get started, I always like to give um, uh, credit to the events in, in history and people who um, work to build uh, the foundation that we're standing on today. So most of the new ideas and innovations in modern programming languages, uh, as uh, we call them today, are actually very, very old, like this old. Uh, and I, I would say it started with lambda calculus um, in, in the 1930s with um, Alonzo Church, more on the theory side of things rather than uh, applied things. But gradually, uh, things start to trickle down in, in uh, mainstream computation and engineering. Uh, for example, 1950s, uh, John McCarthy develops Lisp, the first functional language with some influences from Lambda Calculus, obviously, but retaining variable assignments. Um, in the 60s, Peter Land, uh, Landin uh, develops the first pure functional language, again, strongly based on lambda calculus, and this time, as is the pure name implies, with no assignments. Uh, and in the 70s, uh, John Bacchus, I, I believe for most of you, John Bacchus is associated with uh, either BNF syntax or Fortran. Uh, uh, less people actually know that uh, towards uh, the later part of his career, he uh, thoroughly focused on uh, functional programming paradigms. So um, Bacchus develops FP, um, emphasizing higher order functions, and we're gonna focus quite a bit on higher order functions today. Uh, later on in the 70s, uh, ML, the first fun modern functional programming language, uh, this one introduced type inference and polymorphic types into computation. Uh, as you see, at each stage, each new innovation added uh, new things, new ideas, new capabilities of um, dealing with um, computation concepts and, and uh, pipelining computation. Uh, later on, um, we get to the lazy parts, uh, and nowadays we, we like to leverage the laziness of um, computation and evaluate strictly the necessary parts uh, when processing uh, uh, computation pipelines, uh, think ranges, lazy ranges, lazy evaluation. Um, and this started in uh, early 80s with the Miranda system. And of course, the culmination of all this research uh, is um, Haskell, uh, late 80s, the first to standardize on these concepts. And uh, two more additions that are gonna be relevant in today's discussion. Uh, Phil Wadler uh, and others developed type classes and monads, 
two of the main uh, innovations of Haskell, and I, I believe most of you will do this uh, association when thinking about uh, Haskell. But they are present in most mainstream programming languages as well. We're gonna see examples. So you might ask, okay, if uh, this culmination of all this research, uh, all these good concepts, um, uh, academia surely knows the answers to everything, uh, why aren't we uh, using just that? Well, not so fast. Um, and my claim is that uh, even if Haskell is not uh, primarily used uh, as a mainstream programming language in the industry, although it is, and gaining traction. Uh, by the way, I'm not trying to sell you on using Haskell. This is not a, that kind of a talk. Uh, no, I'm not selling any snake oil here. Um, but my claim is that um, it, it has reached industry and it has become ubiquitous, but not as is. Uh, the idea is we're borrowing all mainstream industrial programming languages borrowed concepts uh, and, and adapted to their um, programming styles and their syntax. And they might look different and might have different names, but the concepts are the same, as I'm gonna try to prove today. So, indeed, even for C++, for contemporary C++, um, our programming language has become more and more functional. Uh, from mundane concepts like uh, lambdas and closures to higher order functions, uh, algebraic data types, um, compositions, um, futures, and all sorts of uh, monads and ways of dealing with computation in this style. And we're going to look at uh, some, uh, some examples. But first, um, just so we, uh, we get a more feel about how to think in terms of goal, or how to think goal-oriented. Uh, a bit of taste of Haskell. Can, uh, I'll try to explain syntax for those who are not familiar, because it looks weird, I know. So, uh, let me see, okay, I got my pointer there. Uh, so, uh, syntax says, uh, I'm applying a function to a list, so a list is x's, where x is the first, is the head of the list, and I'm, I'm recursively applying this function by concatenating two lists, uh, Y's and Z's, where the two lists are defined with some list comprehensions like this. X's are the ones that are smaller than X, and Z's are the ones that are bigger than X. Can someone figure out what algorithm this is? Close. Quick sort, I heard quick sort. Yeah, so if I give them better names, yeah, names matter. Uh, now I think you can uh, more easily understand how it works. So we gather the smaller elements and the large elements than the one we're looking at, and we're recursively uh, applying the function to, to those sublists. And for those of you who are more visually uh, stimulated, uh, this would be like a step-by-step -step, um, expansion of a very short example of applying this function. I think uh, I I even uh, without any programming experience, whilst, while you understand the concept, you can process and you can mentally debug what's going on, like looking at the diagram like this, whereas I would, uh, I would argue that the equivalent imperative code would be much harder to follow. And keep in mind, this is uh, mere pseudocode um, from that book, by the way. Uh, so th the devil is in the details, as always, with imperative style and figuring out edge conditions and um, when to stop and corner cases and plus minus one and so on. So I'll, I'll give you a story now. Uh, in uh, 1986, uh, Donald Knuth was asked to implement a program for programming Perl's column in communications of ACM. 
And the task to solve was to read a file of text, determine the most frequently used words, and print them out in a sorted list according to their frequencies. The kind of interview problem you might get when applying for a job nowadays. Uh, maybe before ChatGPT. Uh, so the solution was uh, written in Pascal by Donald Knuth, uh, and it was 10 pages long. And I, I'm sure you, if you've read some uh, papers or uh, parts of, of his books, you know he's a third person. Like he, he likes to think about all the details. Uh, and I'm not surprised with the length of this implementation. Uh, but I am surprised uh, with the retort. Um, who has heard of Doug McElroy here? I, I see just one hand. That's a shame. So uh, Google him. <laughs> so he's mostly known for uh, the pipe. Uh, and uh, he led the um, uh, programming group uh, that worked on many of uh, now mainstream innovations uh, in Unix. So his response to that same problem was a six line shell script that did the same thing, uh, solved the same problem uh, in those 10 pages of Haskell. And it was about chaining together and building a computation pipeline to process uh, the required um, input. So it's all about pipelines. Uh, my challenge to you is to do this in your favorite programming language, let's say C++, uh, but try to do it in the, in the spirit of Doug McElroy rather than uh, the Donald Knuth path. So let's, let's start on this uh, journey. Uh, how would you start about learning or getting accustomed to some of these concepts? Uh, well, they're rooted in mathematics, and there's uh, branches of mathematics that deal with these kinds of reasoning. Uh, one of them is category theory. Uh, I would, if you want to go that route, um, I, it wouldn't be my recommendation, but this would be the book to start with. Uh, by the way, it's not that thick, <laughs> about half. Uh, but it's a very good book. It's in um, PDF format. It's freely available online. If you want to order, uh, print for order, it's available as well. Um, if you prefer to hold, uh, hold it in your hands. I would recommend starting with grounding uh, into something that's more applicable to what we need to use every day. Uh, and for that, uh, I recommend to start with this book uh, by my friend Ivan. Um, so it's it's a more practical approach uh, with lots of examples that are grounded in uh, recent contemporary C++ and will introduce you to the, some of these concepts uh, in a more familiar fashion than uh, the book by Bartosz Milewski, which uses mostly Haskell as driving examples. Uh, okay, let's examine some, exam uh, some, um, some, some ways of uh, dealing with computation in this style. And I'm going to have um, two main um, streams of um, examples. One stream will be about lifting operations and higher order functions, and one about boxes. Uh, so you could say this talk is about lifting boxes, and that's about it. Uh, so starting with higher order functions, uh, how many of you have an idea of what higher order functions are or have used them? Yeah, about a third of the room. Um, okay, uh, for those who didn't raise their hands, uh, you have used them, by the way. And <laughs> you just didn't recognize them by that name. Uh, so uh, one example of a library that deals with this is uh, boost higher order function. Um, but I, I'm gonna pick on, on a simpler uh, library. Uh, and that would be the lift library. Um, so the, the lift library has some utilities to help you deal with function composition and lifting functions. And let, let me sh uh, show you what I mean by lifting functions. So first of all, just so you know that you've been using some higher order functions, uh, if you've been using any uh, STL algorithms, you've been using higher order functions, 
Um, and some, uh, some examples are here on the slide. I'm sure they're all familiar in terms of, um, and I would also point out that their name delivers the message. Their name is a verb or their name is a predicate. So it delivers the intent rather than the mechanics of achieving that goal. When we say when any, I think we all understand what we mean by when any. We don't need to read that code to understand what that function is trying to do. So um, if we have, if we think about a, a very simple example uh, where we might have uh, two fields in a structure and we want to construct some sort of projection uh, using that structure. For example, we might want to sort um, a, a vector of such uh, elements uh, by using just one of the fields in the structure. Um, I, I think we've all written some sort of lambda to achieve this, or um, hopefully, if you've been using uh, C++ 20 ranges, you've been doing uh, uh, things that way. But just to show, to showcase the lift library, uh, because I, I want to make a point about function composition and applying hardware functions, uh, there's a compose uh, facility that allows us to tie a function, which in this um, um, example is select name. So we can bind select name uh, with a, with a uh, predicate less. And we compose this as you, and use it uh, as uh, the sorting criteria. So it's a way of injecting this projection in our sorting algorithm. Similar thing if we want to find, let's say, um, an employee uh, that has the number or ID number five in this example. So it's a way of composing these functions to achieve the desired projection in our query. So we're doing a query in this case. So hopefully some of you have played around with C++ 20 ranges. Uh, can I have a show of hands who, even for toy examples, who played with ranges? Mm, a bit less than half of the room. Uh, okay, uh, even if you cannot use them for production, for work yet, uh, I would encourage you to play around, at least with some, um, I don't know, tutorials, examples, uh, just to get a feel for, for how they, they're supposed to be used. Um, so one thing I wanna highlight here, um, and I think it's relevant for the discussion coming on, is um, the lifting mechanics. Don't worry about if you don't figure out what this horrible macro does. Uh, that's not what, why it's on the slide for. Uh, the idea is that uh, sometimes we need to compose, we need to lift an overload set of functions. So this is when things get a bit more interesting, I would say. Uh, so if we think of uh, like a very simple example where we need to transform a vector of um, uh, integers to their corresponding, I don't know, string representation for display purposes, let's say. So we, we might have a bunch of two string overloads for different data types. Uh, we might have them for different integer types or floating point or for custom data types and so on. Uh, so we now are dealing, no, we're no longer dealing with uh, a function or pointer to a function, we're dealing with an overload set. Uh, and this is not unusual for C++. So that horrible macro will try to achieve that and select the appropriate overload for uh, this required uh, lifting operation in transform. I'm not gonna go into details there, but uh, by the way, throughout the presentation, I'm gonna point you to several um, resources, including presentations that I recommend you view uh, at your own leisure when, uh, if you wanna dig more into some of these concepts. So if you wanna dig more in, in higher order functions, I recommend this presentation uh, by my friend Bjorn, higher order functions for ordinary C++ developers. And trust me, it's a very practical talk. So uh, no, uh, no theoretical bullshit, just real examples. Um, so now I'm gonna get to boxes, and then we're, trying, we're, we're gonna try to connect uh, lifting operations and boxes. What are boxes? Well, these are some of the 
types of boxes that you might encounter in C++. Um, unique, shared, vector, optional, uh, and so on. And all these kinds of boxes have ways of getting to the value inside. Uh, I've written some ways of, of retrieving the value. Uh, but I, I'm going to try to convince you that retrieving the value inside is an anti-pattern. Anti uh, and uh, yes, I, I'm, I'm going to introduce some ugly words now again. Um, sorry about that. Uh, functor, applicative, and uh, monad. Uh, yeah, sorry. I hope the pretty pictures uh, make it easier. So again, uh, I wouldn't recommend that you start reading category theory books to understand the concepts. Uh, I would recommend starting with that article that I linked there. It's a very approachable, um, pictographic approach to introducing the concepts, um, like you see here on the slide. So the whole idea of dealing with boxes uh, in computation, in functional programming, is about um, doing computation in context. And by context, I mean preserving the values or lack of values in that box uh, and refrain from unwrapping the value in the box, in the context. So as we process computation and we build processing pipelines from function to function and we change such computations, we need to carry these intermediate results or lack of, lack of such results because at any stage, computation might fail, of course. We need to carry this information with its context from function to function, from computation to computation. So rather than at each stage, opening the box, speaking, okay, what's the value? Do I need to decide something based on the value? Then call the other function. Just moving the computation with its context along. Um, that's the whole idea. And all those fancy names that you see there on the slide are about hiding this computation and carrying the context along. So they're just facilities and fancy names given by mathematicians to structure the way we chain computation. And I'm gonna give concrete examples. Um, let's start with optional, one such box. And maybe the most familiar uh, to, to, uh, to you. So I would say, don't look inside the box, don't try to unwrap it. Um, don't try to use optional for error handling because you, we need, you wouldn't need to unwrap it. And uh, when in doubt, draw inspiration from other programming languages that you might be familiar with. Um, let's, for me, for example, Haskell and Rust. Uh, so, yeah, required joke. Moving on. Uh, so, if you've seen Rust code, I'm sure you've seen unwrapping all around. Um, this is the, the, the first way of learning Rust is just unwrap everything because all the APIs that you might deal with return optional things and it's very tempting to, to peek at the value. That's not the way to go around uh, doing it. Uh, but we, we need to start somewhere, right? So I would claim uh, try to avoid branching based on what's with, within a, an optional. So instead of uh, deciding what to do and how to um, orchestrate computation, what functions to call based on whether or not I have a value from the previous computation, uh, try to organize by, uh, by, uh, by piping these computations together and keeping the values inside the optional, even if the type changes from stage to stage. Um, so again, um, I would encourage you to familiarize, if you're not familiar with concepts like FMAP, um, I'm gonna try to do a, a very short tour, introductory tour about using FMAP uh, and assure you that you've been using it in C++, although not with that name. Uh, again, I remind you to uh, have these resources handy to um, familiarize yourself with applicative and FMAP. So let's start with a simple function, a function to capitalize a string. So it takes a string, a standard string as an input and returns the capitalized version of the string. So um, what happens if we get a string 
from some sort of operation that could fail. So we might not get a string. And we decide to encode this uh, behavior using an optional string. Let's say some computation returns an optional string. And we want to capitalize that result if we have it. So one way of doing that would be to test, because there's a very convenient way of testing an optional. So if string, so if we have a value inside the box, then unwrap the value, give it to the capitalized function, and we get the result. Yeah, straightforward. We've all been doing that. So I would urge you to not go that route and keeping the capitalize further in, in the box. So keeping this computation inside the option. So how would we organize this computation so that we avoid that dot value function, that extraction, that unwrap operation? So one way of achieving this is to build a lifted capitalized function. Yeah, I know you might say, okay, this is an overkill for what we're trying to achieve here. But I'm trying to generalize, so bear with me uh, while we build this. So let's say we build a helper function, lifted capitalize, that now, instead of operating from a string to a string, which might be the natural way of doing it, uh, taking an optional string and returning an optional string. So taking a box and returning a box. So, and if we have a value in the box as input, it will capitalize the value and return it inside the context. If we don't have a value as input, it will return an empty box uh, as we expect. So it's about changing the domain and codomain of the function. That's why it's called lifting. Uh, because instead of going from string to string, we go from box of string to box of string. So from optional to optional. So it's a, it's a lifted function. So, and of course we can generalize, it doesn't have to be about strings and not even about optionals. I'm just picking an, one particular box. So going from optional of A to optional of B, changing the input and codomain of the function. So let's see how this would look like. Um, this would be one possible implementation, not the only one. Uh, so we have a function from A to B as input. So our f map is a high order function. A high order function means a function taking another function as argument or returning another function. So f, our f map takes a function from A to B and an optional of A and returns an optional of B, as you might expect. So we mask this uh, operation inside this f map. So if we go back to this pretty picture, that hand reaching inside the box and doing the, the, the application of the function, this is what our f map tries to do. So, so we're wrapping uh, this, uh, we're applying this function while keeping this value inside the box. Um, if, you, if you're not a fan of uh, using a function def defined that way, Here's another way you can define uh, an F map. Uh, and it really, it's not that important how you, how you wanna implement it. Uh, but let, let me show you another example. Uh, we might want to do a transformation on some other type of box. And vector is another type of box. Uh, you might think it's a box of multiple ML elements, but it's a box of A's or a box of Bs, so it's a box, think about the types, not the individual values stored in that uh, vector. So if we wanna F map from a vector of As to a vector of Bs, this is how we might choose to do it. And by the way, hint, hint, standard transform is an F map. Um, uh, it, it's not by accident that I chose this example. So yes, you've been using it. Uh, so let's say we have a vector of strings and we want to produce a vector of their lengths, which, which uh, would be integers, um, and we have a, a length function. This is how we, would, uh, we might be using it. Yeah, I know the syntax is ugly, but I'm, I'm trying to illustrate some, the concept, not 
don't use it as is. So let's see now if we want to compose and chain these two operations together. So uh, we have the uh, we have the trim function and the length function. So we want to trim the text and then calculate its length. So let's assume that any of these operations might fail. So we might get an, an optional value or a, an, an empty optional out of them. So instead of going from uh, string to string, the trim function, we have a lifted uh, trim which goes from optional of string to optional of string. And uh, length, we have a lifted length which goes from optional of string to optional of int this time. So you see the types can be different. Um, so th the same idea, we, we can compose them. Let's see uh, yet another example. Um, let's say we might have, um, um, let's say we're, we're debugging a program, we have some debugging facility and uh, we might get a, a current program counter as an opti optional address uh, and we wanna figure out a debug location for, for that address, like symbol, file, line number, and s s such things. So uh, the load symbol function might fail, um, and then we, this would be the traditional way of dealing with them, checking, okay, did this API fail? Uh, if it didn't fail, let's try to, I don't know, find, figure out the symbol associated with that address and so on. So again, we can achieve this by composing these operations together, composing the load symbol operation with the two string operation, which tries to figure out a string representation for that symbol. So we might even think of in terms of, of um, some pipelining syntax like, like that. So what we've seen so far, we've seen type constructors um, which, by the way, it's a fancy name of um, creating a box. So type constructors uh, wraps a type inside a box, let's say optional or whatever other type. Uh, we've seen function lifting uh, using higher order functions uh, like fmap. I, I would say that's the most simple example. Um, and for any function from A to B, we can create a function from box of A to box of B, whatever box that might be. And we, we saw that it's better for composition and chaining if we use uh, these boxes as, as they are without uh, unwrapping the values. Let me take this even further with uh, another uh, uh, of those scary words. Um, and that would be the monadic extensions to standard optional uh, that we uh, got in C23 now. So let's say, don't worry about the grayed out parts, and those are not important. Let's say we have a function that takes a string view and tries to figure out the, tries, tries to parse a value out of that, if that value is something that's convertible to a, uh, in, an integer. So the important bits are that we're trying to do this parsing and an error might occur, like we might not be able to parse what's there and we return a null optional. The idea here is again, don't try to uh, uh, orchestrate our computation or our follow-up uh, computations uh, by just if else, uh, do I have a value, I don't have a value and so on and propagate through those functions. Instead, trying to chain sequentially as if I, I, I in deliberately uh, formatted the code this way so that we see it as a, as a sequential um, uh, stage. So uh, we do string view to int and then if we manage to get an integer out of that, then uh, we do something with it. In this example, I'm trying to clamp the value or something. Again, not important what I'm doing with it and returning an optional integer uh, to, to uh, push it further down the computation pipeline. Uh, another thing that I might want to do with it is uh, transform it in some way, I don't know, change it in some way. Um, maybe adapt it to some other type or uh, 
process it in some way. Uh, and of course, I can deal with the case. Uh, I can see the or else function. Uh, I can deal with the case where um, I don't have the value there. So um, I might choose to do something. In this case, I'm logging something. Uh, at I would say the essence of this way of uh, chaining computation is that we're extracting the value at the very end of the processing pipeline. So we're constructing, we're, we're, we're trying to figure out what we want to do the values, what are the subsequent operations we're trying to do, either then doing something else later after the computation or transforming the value that was yielded from the previous computation, or dealing with the, the lack of the value and just uh, uh, aborting the computation. And at the very end, we just pick. So we, we moved along this box around the processing conveyor belt, and at the very end, we unwrap, we say, give me the value if it's there or not. Um, so that's, that's the way we need to um, retrain the way we think about uh, computation uh, and, and dealing with such boxes. And I know it might be strange, uh, but um, we, we need to get comfortable with some of these concepts. Uh, just for, for those of you who uh, like to experiment or um, might be familiar with um, uh, these concepts from uh, other uh, programming languages, uh, these ideas are not novel to C++. They're, we borrow them from um, uh, Haskell, from Rust, and so on. And these programming languages have a long history of using them. Uh, and if you want to get a better feel for how to construct uh, such uh, APIs, look at their standard libraries. Look at idiomatic usage in those languages to figure out best practices about how to deal with uh, optional values, for example. So if we look at a very simple example in Rust, we have the option type, which is by the way, constructed as an enum. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Rust, enums in Rust are totally different beast, not like C++. So there, there's, there are ways of type constructing uh, things. So an option might be none or some t, where t is an associated type for that enumeration. So uh, think of them uh, as uh, type constructors on steroids. So um, if we have a, a list uh, and we, we're trying to get, so now we're examining the get API. Uh, of that list, uh, and we try to get that get returns an optional because we might not have that value. Let's say uh, get four uh, will not have uh, the fourth, the fifth value there. So uh, the first example would receive sum, and the associated type is the string Rust, whereas the second example. Uh, returns none because there's nothing on, on position uh, four. So um, this is how we would deal with uh, this concept in, in Rust. And very similarly, not surprising, in, in Haskell, we have the maybe type, which is the, the mother of all types. So this one has a long tradition. And again, it can be type constructed as a just a, with, that's the equivalent of sum in Rust. Uh, or nothing, uh, and uh, this example is using pattern matching. Um, again, don't worry about the syntax if it looks strange to you. The idea is that if we, the API tells us, okay, if we were able to retrieve that value, then I'm gonna use the type constructor just to give you that value. Uh, if you, I cannot retrieve the value, then I'm gonna retrieve, uh, I'm gonna give you the, nothing type constructor. So very similar to um, how um, optional looks like or uh, option in, in Rust. So let's try to draw some parallels here for the concepts. Um, so we have in C++, we have transform and and then. Uh, in Haskell, uh, we call them fmap and bind. So uh, transform is a functor. Uh, whereas and then is a monad, if you care for those fancy names. Uh, don't confuse functor with what some people call uh, function objects. They're not the same thing. Uh, so um, 
you've been using at least uh, an F map in C++ for sure. So standard option is great for expressing some operation that produce no value, but it carries no information about why the value was not produced or why the operation failed. And I, I told you earlier that you should try to avoid using optional for error handling. Uh, there's a better, better construct for that, and that's uh, standard expected, which has an associated type that can be anything, that E type. Uh, and I'm showing you the same, the very same example, where now I choose to encode some parser or type uh, to convey maybe different ways of why this operation could fail at different stages. So I'm using this parser or type to encode unexpected situations, either during range processing or parsing and so on. Uh, so again, uh, we have good heritage for these concepts as well. In Rust, uh, we have the result type, which has two type constructors, OK and error. Um, so again, a very simple example of um, trying to, to do a safe division. Uh, and we have a division by zero error type that I'm using here. Similar thing in, in Haskell, we have the either type with two type constructors left and right. Um, you, you're free to choose how to use left and right, which one should be the, uh, I don't know, happy path or the uh, error handling path. Same concept. In terms of availability, um, just in case you want to run out right now and use them, uh, so a standard optional is fairly old in, in uh, libraries uh, that you might use. Standard exec, uh, expected is GCC 12, Clang 16, and MSVC in 17.3. Uh, and then it's trickier. Uh, so uh, last I looked, the uh, Clang implementation of the standard library didn't have, uh, didn't have it yet. Uh, maybe maybe it's uh, more recent. Uh, I'll have to look it up. Uh, if you're not there yet, uh, there are alternatives. So you can use uh, these implementations uh, from my colleague Sai, uh, uh, TL optional and TL expected. Uh, they're header only. They're, I would say, industrial quality. You can use them. They're fairly used uh, out there. Um, the implementation started way before we had anything in, in, in standard library implementations. Uh, and um, I would say they're, they're fairly well tested. People have been using them for a while. So feel free to incorporate them um, as a stopgap until we, you can get something in, in your standard library. If you want to read more, uh, check out this article uh, by Sai. So, um, I would um, try to conclude about expression yielding values while statements do not, going back to the idea of imperative programming. So think about expressions and computation in terms of values rather than statements and the mechanics of achieving uh, mutation and the uh, desired result. Um, again, very good presentation. Uh, from Ben Dean, uh, think about replacing conditionals in your code. And I like this table very much where uh, Ben draws a, a parallel of different techniques and different styles of programming. Mind you, these are styles of programming, not programming languages. So everything applies in C++. Uh, another great presentation I, I would recommend is uh, Values uh, by Dave Abrahams from CppCon of last year. It's all about whole part uh, value semantics. Um, few more recommendations. Um, value semantics by uh, Juan Pedro Bolivar Puente. A very good introduction to dealing with values and expressions and reconciling using um, functional ideas in, in procedure programming environments and trying to mix those things together and, and using value semantics uh, F, uh, uh, as a way of doing local reasoning and, and composition. So it's a pragmatic uh, presentation showing how to reconcile uh, 
bringing these concepts in existing code bases. It's not about rewriting your code base in a functional style. It's about uh, reconciling these uh, ideas and, and using um, values and, and computation in legacy, in existing code bases, without rewriting everything from scratch. If you care about immutable data structures, this would be an interesting rabbit hole to go down with. Uh, anyway, um, so I, I told you I have many recommendations. So when you get the slides, uh, check out all the links. Uh, so going back to C++ 20 ranges, because I've seen um, about a, a third of the room raising their hands. Uh, so ranges, a quick, um, I don't know, tour de force on, on some examples, hope, hopefully trying to sell ranges to the rest of you who didn't raise their hands. I told you at least uh, try to uh, experiment with two examples to get a feel for how they work. And um, maybe uh, they are start to re resemble in your head to, to Doug McElroy's example of using pipes to uh, calculate those word frequencies. Um, so um, print only the even elements in a range in reverse order. Again, you see the, the difference between how we, we're trying to achieve that in terms of mechanics on the left and the goal on the right. So we're, saying, we're using verbs and predicates in the ranges code. We're saying what, what, uh, what is our intent. Um, skip the first two elements in the range and print only the even numbers of the next three in the range. Yeah, I know, very toyish examples, but uh, just look at how computation is expressed on the right side versus what you would need to figure out what it's doing on, on the left side. You, you would have to scratch your head a bit and uh, understand what, what, what it's trying to achieve on, on the imperative style. This one is not that bad. Uh, it's using uh, algorithms on the left, so I would say it's in pretty good shape. But then again, I would prefer the one that expresses uh, the, the chain of computations that I, I want to achieve. So I'm sorting, I want unique values, and I want it in reverse order. So again, uh, although the, the left one looks fairly good, I would say, uh, I, I would argue that I, I prefer to see the, the right hand side. And even a more ugly example. So. Um, I saw a very recent one uh, that I want to highlight. Um, Connor Hoekstra had uh, uh, a very interesting example. Uh, he solved um, uh, one, I think it was a lead code problem or something like that. Um, I've put the Godbot links here and uh, you can find the problem statement uh, as well if you uh, search it on the internet. So don't try to read the code. The problem is not that trivial, so it will take you at least 15, 20 minutes to understand it. Uh, but I provided the links so you can play with it. Just appreciate the left and right hand side. So on the right hand side, I have two solutions. One from Connor, the one on the bottom, and one from Tristan Brindle. And on the left side uh, is probably a correct, not sure, probably a correct implementation by Connor as well. So uh, just to appreciate the style of how it's, uh, it's, it's solved. So I would say it's very much in the spirit of what we've seen with uh, Doug McClory's uh, Unix shell script. So if we would try to do um, um, Donald Knuth's task or translate uh, uh, Doug's example in C++, maybe it will look something like that. Uh, again, don't worry about the details. So before we close, uh, I, I try to sell you on, on ranges a bit at the end. Uh, there are some caveats. Uh, it's not all roses. So this, I call this my uh, Nico Yosuti slide. So uh, ranges come with some gotchas and you need to be aware of them. Uh, they're not all specific to, to views. Um, some of them are just around reference semantics in general. So they're general C++ problems. Uh, that, but you might run into them in the context of views and it might seem surprising. So yes, views have reference semantics. So all the reference gotchas in C++ apply to views as well. Uh, as always with C++, const is shallow 
so it doesn't propagate as you might expect, so don't be surprised about that. Uh, some functions uh, do caching, so be aware of um, begin, empty, filter, and drop. Uh, they do some caches in, in uh, depending on, on uh, structure they, they work on. Uh, so I would say a safe advice is don't try to hold on to views or try to reuse them. So the safest way to use them would be to use them ad hoc as temporary processing or temporary stages in your processing pipeline. Don't try to store views anyway or reuse them. It's, it's a recipe for disaster. And that's what gives them maybe a bad reputation. So if the, you use them as they're intended to be used, um, you're gonna be safe. Same thing applies to, I don't know, string view, span, or other uh, vocabulary types that you might be used to and uh, might come with some sharp edges um, if you're not using them right. So um, you can always copy them. Uh, many of them are cheap to copy. So uh, just to close up, remember, this guy, uh, Phil Wadler from uh, Haskell. Uh, so my advice to you would be uh, try to make your code readable. Uh, pretend that the person uh, looking at your code is a psychopath and they know where you live. So try to write code to be easily read and understood and easily testable. Uh, code is uh, read much more frequently than it's written. So try to write code that is easily maintainable and testable. Uh, okay, that's about it. So uh, there's, there are a few minutes for questions, um, but you can always catch me on the hallways as well if you, I don't know, maybe if you're, if you're shy to approach on camera. So if someone has questions now, you're, Uh, can, can you say it a bit louder? Yeah. I think we can stop the recording and take the questions offline. And then function of well, option. <sighs> so transformations you do on the transformations you do on the views don't don't care about the types they work on. So if the types involved in those transformations are optionals, it, they will work. It, you just, uh, you would deal in terms of optionals uh, with the values. And the problem that might arise, uh, arise there is in some transformation, you might end up with optionals of optionals when you do those transformations. And then you will need a way of flattening the, the optional types, like using joins and, and similar concepts. So uh, they can definitely be used, but m challenges might arise when needing to collapse optionals of optionals or optionals, depending on how deep the, the chaining might occur. If the input of a computation might be an optional, some transformation might yield an, like a very nested option. Uh, I would recommend, there's a, I'm trying to remember the name. Uh, uh, Jonathan Mueller had, uh, Mueller, yeah, I think, uh, has a nice uh, blog article about that with some examples. I, I'll try to look it up. Uh, I don't remember what it's called. Uh, something with nested option or something. <laughs> I'll look it up from uh, Funatan. Uh, people know, know him as Funatan on, on Twitter and internet. 